Good evening. First of all, may I call your attention to the fact that in this room there is no evil influence and there is no good influence. This is just a blank, vacant room. Floors, ceiling, walls, air, light, nothing else. Neither good nor evil occupies this room. And therefore, whether you or I experience good or evil in this room will depend on what we bring in with us. What we bring in with us will be made manifest in this room and in the experience of each other. In other words, if I bring to this room a spirit of love, sharing, a spirit of peace, or if before entering this room I have meditated and opened my consciousness to the Spirit of God, then I bring the Spirit of God to this room and to all who are in this room. I bring the Spirit of the Christ. I bring Christ peace. I bring the wine, the water, the bread, the spiritual substance of the Son of God to you. If, remember, it's all if. If before I entered this room, I opened my soul to receiving the grace of God, then I have brought to this room and to you the grace of God, the Spirit of God, the love of God, and this is now flowing through me to you. Not from me, it is from God to you, but I am the transparent which said, Enter, Lord, or Speak, Lord. And therefore, I am the transparency through which God's grace now flows to you. And there is no reason why you should not leave this room with a higher sense of spiritual good, with... Uh, a lighter feeling with a greater awareness of a divine presence even with healing because the Spirit of God does heal. You who enter this room bring with you whatever it is that you brought with you. Those of you who have been taught in this work, I know what you brought with you because I know that you would not enter any room or business, temple, church, streetcar, bus, automobile, without first having opened your consciousness to the Spirit of God. Therefore, wherever you are, The Spirit of God is with you. You are a transparency through which it is flowing. Those of you who have not been taught in this way may have brought your troubles here, your worries or your fears or your hates or jealousies or animosities. And if so, you have not brought light and peace unto us which you might have done but of this you can be assured that we who have been so instructed are bringing light and peace to you so that as you leave here that you may have less fear worry concern anxiety hate envy jealousy malice 
because you are being touched by the Spirit of God that is flowing in this room through each and every one of us who have been taught in this way. In other words, you have entered a holy presence, the presence of God, the presence of God in the consciousness of each one who has opened themselves to that presence. If you undertake a study of this work, a practice of this work, you will discover that you also will very soon find that you are treated differently by members of your family, your business, your friends, because it will not take long for them to notice that you are bringing something into their presence that wasn't there before and that you did not have with you before. So let me show you a major principle of our work and one which you may test and that is this. Your consciousness is in and of itself an instrument. And your activity of consciousness determines the outer experience of your life. Of course, in the human picture, we were taught that circumstances, environment, education or lack of education, all played a part in our success or failure in life, our happiness or unhappiness in life. And I give it to you with 35 years of practical experience that this is a lie. This is a lie. You make your own life once you know the truth. And you make it or you break it by the degree of truth you know or your ignorance of truth. If you allow your mind or consciousness to be played upon by outside influences, by world beliefs, then of course you are whipped around in that manner. But once you understand that your life is determined by whether or not you entertain truth in your consciousness, then your life begins to change. In this way then, when I learned that my life's experience was determined by me and not by anybody external to me and not by any circumstances or conditions, I learned that if I kept my consciousness filled with the Spirit of God, that those I met out here recognized it. And in some measure, their attitude toward me changed. In other words, I was less apt to be judged by human standards it was more than likely that that Spirit of God which was flowing through me would in some measure reveal itself to those whom I met. Then I learned the second part of that principle and that is this, that if I thought of you 
as male or female, or young or old, or good or bad, or rich or poor, or young or old, that's just about what you gave back to me. But in the moment when I stop judging by appearances and recognize the fact that God breathed his life into you as well as into me, that the Spirit of God dwelt in you as well as me, then when we met, even as strangers, instead of seeing you as you humanly appear to be, I began to see that look in your eye that soul shining through, that which humans can't see because they're so busy looking at whether you're beautiful or not beautiful or whether you're well-dressed or not well-dressed or whether you look honest or do not look honest, that they can't quite see your soul shining through your eyes. Now, life changes completely the minute I recognize that whether or not I am humanly anything special or ordinary but when I recognize that in spite of whatever I may humanly be there is the Spirit of God in me there is an indwelling spirit my shoulders immediately go back and uh, I have a higher regard for myself. I have a higher regard for me as an individual. I'm not concerned about what my parents were or my grandparents or where they came from or what their condition of life may have been. I'm concerned only with one thing, the Spirit of God dwelleth in me. Somewhere, somehow, his spirit is with me from the beginning before Abraham was and will be unto the end of the world if I'm not yet manifesting it in my outer life at least I know that potentially I am the son of God I am heir to the qualities of God I do have an inner integrity I may not yet be displaying it fully outwardly but at least I know that I do have an inner integrity and so for me that which is the foundation of Christianity and originally was the foundation of what we might call Americanism has come to life that is the integrity of the individual the freedom of the individual, the equality of the individual, that comes to life in me. But it never completes itself until I then look out here and begin to realize the full integrity of manhood is yours. The full integrity of womanhood. I don't care what your present offenses may be, due to ignorance of your identity. I don't care what your present state of life may be. I can look through your eyes because I know now that looking out from there is that which called forth the original revelation of Christianity, the integrity of individual being, the divinity of individual being. And... Uh, I can understand what is meant by all men were created equal. All men didn't stay equal, that's right. And the reason they didn't stay equal was because they didn't know that their equality came from God and not from man. And they lapsed into the belief that that equality could be taken from them. And so they permitted it. Now, 
in any given moment, any given moment, this moment, that I recognize the integrity of my individual being because of my divine sonship, not because of my human goodness. Why callest thou me good? No, 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 not because of my human goodness. I may still fall far short of that. But because of my divine sonship, I am equal. I am heir of God, joint heir with Christ to all the heavenly riches. I am son of the one God, therefore brother and sister to every individual who has ever appeared anywhere on the face of the globe, then I can look out and see that in your eyes and acknowledge your integrity, your individuality, recognize the divine sonship of your infinite spiritual being. And I can tell you from experience, my experience and that of thousands of students, that life changes at once, within an hour. We see each other differently and we are seen differently by those who meet us. It is for this reason that it is so much to be regretted that the word mysticism is so misunderstood. To hear people speak, you would almost imagine that mysticism is uh, something far-fetched, something strange, something uh, unreal, and of course very unpractical. May I say to you also from that many years' experience that when the truth is revealed as it someday will be revealed, the truth of mysticism. Mysticism is the only practical way of life that has ever yet been devised. Nothing and no system, no system ever discovered or invented by man has proven to be as practical as the mystical way of life. Why? Well, let me show you why. Certainly there is nothing more practical than good human relationships within our family circle, within our friendship circle, within our community circle. And no one on the face of this globe following any teaching that has ever been discovered or taught enjoys the family relationships, the community relationships, the business relationships of those who follow the mystical path. Why? Because first of all, I have taken the first step of recognizing the source of my integrity, the source of my qualities, and the infinite nature of my being. And in doing that, I have recognized this in you. And therefore, watch this carefully, I approach you and you approach me without any desire to get anything, borrow anything, steal anything defraud anything. In other words, once I know the nature of my identity, of the divinity of my being, of my sonship with God, I do not need anything that you have. You, as far as I am concerned, are welcome to all that you have, and I will take none of it from you. I will neither envy it, nor desire it, nor be jealous of it because I have my own fulfillment in my divine sonship. And therefore I release you. You owe me nothing. Nothing. Not even thanks. 
for whatever it is that I share with you is not of myself, it's of my Father. So if you owe any thanks, you owe it to him. And therefore, I do not even hold you in bondage to saying thank you. In other words, in my relationship with you, I place no ties upon you. Now this is true in my family life. I share with them and they share with me, but we do not claim that each owes the other anything. In my community life, I share with my community in every way possible the practical way of philanthropy or the spiritual way of prayer, but I ask nothing in return because I recognize that whatever I am sharing with them is the gift of God through me. Therefore, they owe me nothing. In this message of the infinite way, now in its 17th or 18th year, we have never had a membership. We have never had dues. We have never asked for a contribution. Every individual who has come to us has been free in coming and free in going. And never once have they been under an obligation to us for anything. Do you wonder they love us? Do you see what it means to be set free? To feel that no one is clutching you? No one is demanding something of you? No one is feeling that you owe them something? Is there anything more practical then than coming to the realization of your true identity and setting every individual free whom you meet? Share and share liberally, but not of yourself. Share the grace of God that has come to you. Let them share if they will, but do not demand it. And do not hold anyone in bondage. No one, no one must ever be held in bondage. Why? Because I and my Father are one, and I want to abide in that oneness, and I want you to have the privilege of abiding in that oneness. So the first measure of practicality we experience is this. There is a greater degree of love in our family life, in our community life, in our national life, in our international life. A far greater degree of love because we are holding no one in bondage, we're holding no strings on anyone, we're holding no one under any obligation to us. Then. Just think of this. In this human picture, think of how dependent people are on each other. To the extent sometimes that a wife actually believes that she's dependent on her husband and what would she do without him? Or a husband is believes he's so dependent on his job or his business or his investments that what would he do without them? And one nation is so dependent on another nation Well, just think of the word dependency in human relationships and think it whether that's practical or not or if that isn't just a form of slavery and bondage but now In our meditation, we say, I, the Spirit of God, stand at the door of your consciousness and knock, and knock for admittance. We, living the mystical life, we turn within and we invite the Spirit of God, the I, the Son of God, to enter. And what do you think happens right away? The voice says, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Whew. 
right out the window goes that fear that dependence on somebody or something immediately I in the midst of you am come this spirit of God that you have bid enter you that you have invited in says now that I'm in I am here that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly from me the spirit of God in you well it's almost too good to believe until a day or two or five or ten the same voice says to you I am the bread and the meat and the wine and the water this I this presence of God that you have admitted into your soul is your food and clothing and housing even more I am the resurrection if your body is dying or dead if your pocketbook is dying or dead if your family life is dying or dead I the Spirit of God in you am the resurrection I will restore the lost years of the locust and you say what this in the midst of me where have you been all my life oh I have been here closer than breathing nearer than hands and feet but you where have you been you have been out looking to friend and neighbor and relative but the invitation was look unto me and be saved the master in the 15th chapter of John tells us if you abide in me if you let me abide in you the Spirit of God the Son of God you will bear fruit richly well all you have to do is live this life for a week or two or three and find out for yourself if it isn't true that there is a spirit in you that goes before you to make the crooked places straight that there is an invisible spirit in you that goes before you to prepare mansions for you see if it isn't true once you open your consciousness to the Spirit of God the Son of God if you haven't found your Savior your mediator not in a man not even in a man who lived 2,000 years ago not in Jesus oh no in the Spirit of God that Jesus announced oh you will find that this is so practical that you will even understand the scripture that says I have never seen a righteous man begging bread you will never see a poor man a dead man a slave man who has opened his soul that Christ may enter in the Spirit of God may enter in never never because in the presence of God is fulfillment in thy presence is fullness of life therefore the moment you have brought the presence of God the Spirit of God the Son of God to your consciousness it acts exactly the way light acts upon darkness in the presence of light there can be no darkness now it isn't that light does something to darkness it is only because actually there is no darkness what we call darkness is an absence of light and therefore in the presence of light there is no darkness and can be none and in the presence of the Spirit of God there can be no lack or limitation no sin no false appetites no disease no death these all begin to evaporate 
dissolve, disappear, as the Spirit of God is made real, realized in your consciousness. You see, the entire ministry of the Infinite Way had its beginning with an experience. I was very fortunate in having been brought up in a home where no religion was taught. That was my greatest blessing. My mother set me free to find God. She taught us the Ten Commandments so that in obeying them we would be good citizens and stay out of trouble. But for the rest, she said, you will find God yourself. And so it was I was sent to Europe at sixteen and a half years of age to learn the foreign end of the import business. And my first week in Europe was in England. And I stood on a street corner after having visited many cathedrals and Westminster Abbey and churches when a newspaper extra came out that the British fleet and the German fleet were lined up in the North Sea ready to shoot. So happened that wiser heads prevailed and World War I did not begin until five years later. But it might have begun that day. But it was as if I had been struck with a bolt of lightning because I guess the furthest thing from my thought was that in this age there could be such a thing as war between men, nations. I, I suppose it, it just had never registered in my consciousness that those things didn't belong to the ancient of days. And then it was immediately followed with this. But what about all these churches and cathedrals and prayer? And God. Now, now this is a very strange thing. They're talking about a war, but for years and years and years people have been praying for peace. And they've been praying for God's government. And they go to church and they're good. Is there no God to answer? No God to listen? No God to intercede? What is this thing about God? And this started the train of thought. What about God? What is the relationship between God and this universe? What is the story about God and man? Well, it wasn't long after that a few weeks until I saw Paris. Some very unnice things about Paris, too. And again, this question came How can these things be? And the God, where was God when all of this took place? And from then on, for 20 years in the business world, this is the question that plagued me. Oh, I went to churches, spoke to ministers and rabbis and priests, but they didn't know anything about why evil was or where it came from, except maybe it was uh, God's way of bringing us home. I thought well, it's a good way. We give that to parents. If they have children, just have them cut their throats and uh, sell them into prostitution. That'll bring them home. That's what God does. Why shouldn't parents do it? No, I couldn't believe that. But there must be an answer. There has to be. And for you, some of you who may be a bit impatient that truth isn't coming 
quickly to you, take uh, consolation that I'm slower than you. For I waited 20 years before I received the answer. Just 20 years later. And when I received it, the whole secret of life was open to me. There is no God in this world, and there is no God functioning in the human scene, and there is no God functioning in the human race. God only functions where God is admitted into consciousness. Unless you open your consciousness to God, you have no God, and anything can happen to you. Accidents, sins, diseases, wars, lacks, untimely deaths, anything can happen because God doesn't interfere to stop it. Only, only when an individual opens their consciousness to God does God enter in. I stand at the door and knock. And if you want me, open the door of your consciousness and admit me. That was the first lesson I learned. It opened a word that so far as I know has no literature in the world outside of the message of the infinite way and that word is consciousness which is the basic word of the infinite way and without which no one can understand this message. Consciousness is the word on which our entire life is based. And the first understanding is to whom ye yield yourself, him you must obey. And if you open your mind to ignorance, you will obey ignorance in every form. If you open your mind to the light which is God, you will serve God and be served. But you, you, each one of us individually, must come to a place where we consciously accept God. and where we consciously accept God in the midst of us closer than breathing. Not in holy mountains, not in holy temples, not up in the sky. That kind of a God hasn't served anyone at any time. But closer to you than breathing, you must acknowledge in the midst of me and you, there is a Spirit of God which is my bread, meat, wine, and water, which is my resurrection, which is the health of my countenance, which is my rock and my fortress, which is my safety and security, which is my supply, which is my husband, which is my wife, which is my child, which is my father. And then I can say with Paul, I live, yet not I. It's the Spirit of God that's living through me, in me, through me, as me, and this Spirit of God in me is my supply. Not dollars out here. Not only dollars have a way of disappearing. In this age, they have a way of shrinking. <laughs> oh, there were olden days, you know, when they sold woolens guaranteed not to shrink, but nobody guarantees dollars not to shrink. But I never shrink. And so if a dollar becomes 50 cents, be assured, I will give you two. Look unto me, though, not unto the dollar. Now, the second principle that revealed itself to me, which is so practical that I wonder nobody ever thought of it before in this modern age. It's a waste of time to ask God for health, wealth, happiness, rent, food, or peace on earth. 
because God doesn't know anything about those things. They are absolutely foreign to the nature of God. God is spirit. And therefore, it is illegitimate to pray to God. In fact, it's immoral, paganistic, to pray to God for anything but the spirit of God. We must pray in spirit and in truth, not for dollars and automobiles and houses and wives and husbands and divorces. This is praying as the pagans do. You know where that form of prayer originated? Back in the most ancient of days, when primitive races found a season of too much rain or too little rain or not enough fish in the sea or not enough cattle on a thousand hills and they knew nothing to do about it they knew no way to increase supply they knew not what to do and so they had to look for a superhuman way of getting what they couldn't humanly get and so they invented a god And they prayed to this God, increase our fish, increase our herds, give us more rain, give us less rain. And probably for a while it worked. But eventually it must have failed because they invented a second God. And they had one God for crops and one for rain and another one for fertility and another one for, well, for each item they had a different God. But always they went to that God whom they had conceived themselves, made up out of their own imagination, to supply them not with uh, what God ordained for them, but what they thought they needed or wanted. Evidently, the many gods failed also, because in the days of King Menotep IV, King Menotep learned, undoubtedly from India, that there is only one god. And so he decreed that all of the statues of all the gods must be destroyed in his kingdom, and only one god worshipped. Well, the population could just take that for so long, and then they began to long for those other gods they'd been deprived of, and so they sent King Menotep scampering, and they brought back all of their other gods. But this close friend of King Menotep, Abraham, fled out of the kingdom and established the Hebrew race founded on one god, Well, you know, the Hebrews found that hard to take, too, because one day in Moses' absence, they decided to build themselves a golden calf so at least they'd have a little ace up the sleeve in case the one God didn't uh, function. At other times, the same Hebrews decided to uh, adopt the gods of the neighbor, neighboring tribes, the pagans around them. Always they had to be whipped back into worshipping one God. Because human nature is that way. You know, sometimes uh, we're that way now in metaphysics. If we don't think our practitioner is healing us fast enough, we'll get another one to help along, and then sometimes a third one. It's the same idea, you see. If one God can't do it, let's have two. Now, throughout all history, there have been mystics. There have been five major mystics, each of whom gave the same teaching. The teaching of Krishna, the teaching of Lao Tzu, the teaching of Gautama the Buddha, the teaching of Jesus Christ, 
all of these agree on one thing and that is that there is no such thing as a God that God actually is the soul of man the consciousness of man that's why we speak of the Buddha mind or the mind that was in Christ Jesus if you had the mind that was in Christ Jesus you wouldn't need any other God and you wouldn't have to do any praying because you would be healing the multitudes and feeding the multitudes without any prayers in fact you'd be saying to the sick and the sinning what did hinder you pick up your bed and walk you never heard Jesus praying to God to heal anyone or to feed anyone or even to forgive them their sins oh no oh no I forgive you thy sins are forgiven thee now you see the secret of all mystics is the same the kingdom of God is within you the question then arises the kingdom of God is within me and it is this kingdom of God within me that is to make my life practical demonstrably happy healthy wise successful but what is my approach to that spirit of God within me that consciousness of God within me that God consciousness or Christ consciousness what is my approach to it and the answer is one word prayer but in order to understand that word you must first forget all that you have ever been taught about prayer because if what you had been taught about prayer was true none of us would be here in this room tonight that prayer would be taken care of each and every one of us bountifully and beautifully the only reason we're here is the prayers of our childhood and the prayers of our churches did not fulfill their promise and the answer is in the Bible also if you pray amiss it won't work to start on this mystical life you will have to acknowledge that you have been praying amiss now you will not take my word for what is prayer in spite of what it has done for me and what it has done for the tens of thousands of families who have adopted this way of prayer because I've said this to many classes the most dangerous path you can fall into is the path of faith heaven help you if you have faith in anything because sooner or later you're going to regret it and I have never yet asked anyone to have faith in what I've said taught or written I merely present this as my experience and the experience of those who have been following in that way but for you I present it with the opportunity that you may try it experiment and see where it gets you you see faith means having faith in something or somebody and there isn't anybody that you have any right to have faith in whatsoever it's a dangerous path faith in an unknown God is a very dangerous path faith in anything unknown is a dangerous path the master doesn't say have faith in the unknown but he says ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free but ye shall know the truth and you can try the spirits too and see whether they work now this 
is the most important part of the entire mystical path to know God aright to know the nature of God it will do you no good to have faith in God it will do you no good to believe in God it will do you no good to rest back and say let God do it it is really a scriptural truth a mystical truth that you must know God aright if you want life eternal you must know God aright nothing less will do now let us see about God the presence of God that is in you and in me let us see if we can discover its nature so that we will know how to pray aright the prayer of a righteous man availeth much It doesn't mean necessarily the prayer of a moral man or a prayer of a churchy man because the master said that John the Baptist was the greatest of the Hebrew prophets but he wasn't going to get into heaven. He did not understand God. He had blind faith. He had an emotional faith but no understanding. And so he said the least of these will get into heaven before even that great Hebrew prophet you must know God aright now let us see scripture reveals that the nature of God is omniscience which means all wisdom and if this should be true if this should be true that God is omniscience the all wise the all knowing then it must mean that we have no right to tell God anything that he already knows our need and that any prayer that has in it anything of the nature of telling God must be an erroneous sense of prayer a mistaken sense it must be praying amiss even to tell God that we are praying for Mrs. Jones or Brown or Smith or whether we're praying for Mr. Jones's business it's all nonsense because if God is omniscient God knows what we're praying for before we start to pray the mere fact that we're going to close our eyes in prayer God's there before us in all knowingness therefore we need not speak or think one single word I remember to think one word or speak one word is to violate prayer it is to pray amiss we have to go to God close our eyes with a realization God in the midst of me is omniscience the all-knowing then we further learn in scripture that God is omnipresence now you know this is a tremendous thing because you don't have to go to Jerusalem you don't have to go to Rome you don't have to go to a synagogue you don't have to go to a church as a matter of fact if you're lost in the desert or if you're in a rubber boat out in the ocean you don't have to go anywhere God is already there as omnipresent it doesn't make any difference which room you are in in your home living room bedroom bathroom out in the garden it makes no difference because wherever you are the presence of God got there just before you or at least came with you yes came with you because the presence of God is in you the kingdom of God is within you therefore wherever thou art I am wherever I am thou art if you mount up to heaven you will find the Spirit of God is there with you if temporarily you are making your bed in hell turn within and you will find that the Spirit of God is there with you 
And if you are walking through the valley of the shadow of death, turn within and you will find that the Spirit of God is there with you. And then, even if you should be a little late and find that you're dead, you will discover that neither life nor death has been able to separate you from God. For I and the Father are one. You mean that isn't practical? To know that I cannot get outside of God's presence, I cannot get outside of God's grace? In heaven, in hell, in sin, in disease, in death, even the woman taken in adultery wasn't outside the presence of God, for neither did I condemn her. You see the practical nature of mysticism that you cannot escape God as long as you are not praying to God for yourself, your children, your neighbors, or for anything. As long as you're not praying for help or supply or companionship. As long as you are merely praying, thank you, Father, for omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence. Well, we nearly missed omnipotence, didn't we? Do you know what separates all prayer from fulfillment? Expecting God to be a power over your sins and diseases and lacks. And if God is omnipotent, there aren't any such powers for him to be a power over. Therefore, looking to God for power is enough to separate you from divine grace. If God is omnipotent, how can you fear sin, disease, death, lack, or limitation when you have the opportunity of praying God the all-knowing, God the omnipresent, God the omnipotent, and then turn over and go to sleep. And let the truth make you free. Don't try to manipulate the truth into making you free. Just know I in the midst of thee am mighty and let that truth work. You know, we pray and then try to put the prayer at work and then try to harness God up. He shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Oh, I'm so sorry to tell you that it's all over. It's a shame, really and truly. I haven't started. So I'll say good night. But I hope you'll come back and let me finish tomorrow because I'm just bubbling with it. Thank you. <laughs>